afternoon, good morning from wherever you're joining us in the world. We're just going to give it a few moments for people to trickle in and join us. So please do use that chat box if you can, whether you're watching us on your laptops, maybe you're on your mobile phones, maybe you've got a separate device. Please do let us know whereabouts in the world you're joining us. I'm here in London. Amy and Scott are in Seattle. So we're already very international on different time zones here. We should have quite a few of you guys joining today. So please do stick with us for the next 45 minutes. And we're going to be covering lots of different information and have time for Q&A and a discussion as well, which is great. So please do let us know whereabouts you're coming from. And yeah, as Amy says there, how long have you been using LumaFusion? We had quite a few of you talking to us in the Google form where we got you guys to sign up. And it really is a range today of experience levels, what devices you're using, how long you've been using LumaFusion, whether you've used desktop editing suites before or you've just purely stayed mobile, and also lots of different types of video projects that you've been working on, um, holiday videos, mini documentaries, YouTube series, and there's even some journalists in here as well that are looking to, you know, really kind of branch out and use some new technology as part of their everyday workflow. So it's going to be a really interesting session today. And as I say, we'll give it a few moments. So everybody get yourself comfortable, uh, get settled, cup of tea, get your editing devices ready. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to a, quite an interesting discussion over the next 45 minutes. Uh, Scott, can you tell us please, because you're our device guy at LumaTouch with all the, all, the, all the external drives, which we're looking forward to talking to you about later in today's session. Can you tell us why external editing is such a, a, a hot topic here at LumaTouch and why this webinar of media management is such an important one to have? Yeah, you bet. Well, so it's only a relatively recent uh, uh, innovation for LumaFusion that we've been able to edit on the devices directly to and from an external SSD. And that is, um, that's something that can happen because newer devices have faster processors and faster the USB um, port that the uh, you know the the uh, iPad Pros, iPad Airs, all all iPads currently and the new iPhone 15 Pro models have that, and it's true also of a lot of Android devices. That uh, that bus is fast enough to send signal, even quite high bitrate signal um, across. Uh, uh, across the wire so that you can edit from it directly. Um, you can connect, even, even with devices that aren't on that list, you can connect to them and move media back and forth, but they don't move it quite quickly enough to edit from. And why that is nice is because, you know, I mean, our cameras these days are producing 4K signals. Sometimes we're shooting with log or 5K or 6K even, and uh, uh, very heavy files. Traditionally, uh, LumaFusion downloads the media to the device, the edit device, just to have it sitting there all handy and safe so that it can edit from that. But not everybody wants to download tens or hundreds of gigabytes of material just to edit a video. And so with external SSD editing, oh, look, it disappears. With external drive editing, you can keep that media, keep it safe, and have it as part of your project in the in immediacy, just right there for you. But there are a lot of users that still don't don't appreciate that they can edit on external drives as well. Even just today, I had an email from somebody who we've done LumaTouch Academy training with before saying, oh, it would be a really great suggestion to bring this into the app. And I said, well, we've got a webinar for you. So yeah, it, <laughs> I think, and it is quite exciting. I think the first time people start working with external drives with Luma, like it almost seems, so it, it was at one point it was so far away you know to be able to do that on your essentially your mobile phone and now it is in all of our hands so um thank you scott amy you're our customer support with today so can you tell us a little bit about some of the problems and challenges that potentially our users are having or what kind of questions you get when it comes to media management yeah, I mean, it's always been the case that media management is a challenge, like from the beginning of editing. But I think now, especially with mobile editing, like some people are doing it, you know, they've got a DSLR camera that they're shooting with, they've got a phone, maybe they have a backup phone, they have an audio source. And then they're also like importing media from, you know, archival footage from Google Drive or Dropbox. And it's just, it's it can be really, it's like you can be in the most creative headspace 
And then you have to deal with like, but wait, where is this media living? So I think it is really important. It's like always important. Like, how do you set up your project? What is the media you're looking at? And because what happens is people get so into their creative process and then they're like, but wait, where did this media go? Or I, you know, I needed to switch devices. And then that's when things get messy. So that's what we're going to get to today is like, how do you set yourself up for success and like be in control of your project? Yeah, it's such a shame when people come to that stumbling block as well, isn't it? Because it's like you're in your creative flow, you've got new ideas, you're whizzing around the timeline, and then you get a piece of missing media or suddenly your device is like, where is that content? As you say, you're editing from so many different pieces. So it's almost like getting the the foundations of our project sorted before we can have fun. But I think it is worth it in the long run, as we know from having devices where we're like, oh, we've got too much, too much stuff everywhere. We need to kind of declutter. Um, That's so right. Then, Knowledge is power. Knowledge is editing power. It, for sure. And we're going to record this, this episode as well, guys, to this chat. So if you're watching today and you're thinking, okay, I don't have enough like time to start looking at my app and make notes and ask questions, I would just encourage you to just really get involved into the session today as as Amy and Scott said you know check out that webinar chat ask your questions in there if you've got any workflow issues that you're having yourself this is the time to speak to the LumaTouch team directly so we're here to help you live and uh, you can always go back and re-watch things later on and I will be posting this to our YouTube channel as well so you will have that resource and this probably is a great time to say on our YouTube channel we do have lots of questions that have already been answered and lots of amazing LumaFusion editors are involved within the community and will join you in chats underneath some of those videos as well. So please do and, make sure you are getting in touch. And if I can just jump in, Caroline, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll be dropping links to, I, I made a series a while back of three videos about media management um, within LumaFusion. It's going to cover a lot of the same territory. So if you really, I mean, if this opens up a, uh, some landscape for you that you get excited about or know you need to learn more, you can hit these links and dive into that series. And also uh, a couple of other links to our user guide, the section about external drive editing, the section about media management and, and so forth. So we're going to provide some resources when we publish this on YouTube. Great. And, and, you know, there is a lot to learn, guys. And we're constantly, as editors, experiencing new technology, you know, starting with a new workflow, perhaps you've only been editing short form video and now you're going to be starting to work with long form video with a lot of data and a lot of um, huge media files. So this might be something you're watching today thinking, oh, actually, I probably don't need that maybe because I haven't got, you know, a big project to work on or perhaps it's the other way around. Whatever stage of learning you're at, it's just always important just to keep in mind all of these extra bits we're going to teach you. And the best way to learn is just by practicing and doing it yourself. So I would encourage you guys to just, as I say, just get stuck in with that. So without further ado, we're going to dive straight into the material today. So I'm just going to share my screen so you guys can see. And uh, as, of course, we've already introduced, we're going to be talking about managing our media. OK, so we're going to be talking firstly about managing our media on the device itself, no matter what tablet you use. You know, some of you might be working with iOS, some of you Android, some of you smartphones, some of you on, on your larger screens. It does not matter. The, the important thing is that we're going to really, as Amy said, start our projects off in the best way to give ourselves the best chance of success later on down the timeline. So we're not stressing out with a half finished project, not knowing where our media is and, and panicking that we don't have enough storage and, and so on. So uh, for those of you that have just joined, um, my name is Caroline Scott. I'm part of the content creation team. We're also joined by Scott Squire, who is a part of the content creation team and quality assurance team. And Amy Benson is part of our customer support team. So on hand to help you with any questions that you have today. So we're gonna dive straight into the app now. So if you do have your devices on you, please do open them up and you can have a look with me. So as you can see here, I am in a fresh, beautiful brand new project. And I'm gonna be covering the section of today's class where we're gonna be thinking about some of the techniques that you can use within the editor itself in order to manage your media in a little bit of a more organized manner. So if you're working with media that's already on your device, okay? So that's maybe photos and videos, 
that you've actually taken on the device itself. Maybe you've airdropped them in. Perhaps you've imported them, in which case they would be in your imported folder here. Or perhaps you're linking to an additional folder, which is from an external app, which has a media storage folder within that. Or you might be working with an external drive, which Scott's going to cover later on. But for now, we're going to be thinking about some of the albums that we have on our device, whether we've imported that in, whether we're accessing it from another app, or whether we're working with the content that's already in our camera roll. OK, so if you've brought that content into your device, we're going to be thinking about, OK, how do we manage our media from the get go? Now, you can see here I've got 4,108 items in my camera roll, okay? That's just in my camera roll. That's not even the content that's been imported from external um, you know, apps like your Dropboxes, your Google Drives, and so on. So the first thing to do is when you're working on a project, it's always a great idea to start working with albums within your camera roll. So you can see here, when you make an album within your device's camera roll, it turns into an album naturally in your media library. This is a replica of what you can see in the camera roll itself. So you can see here, I have an album called Albums, um, helpfully. And you can see here, we've got different thumbnails and these are representing the different albums. Now, what I tend to do as an editor, I'm working on videos every single day. If I had a, an, a, an album, every single video I did, that would be great, but I would be scrolling through these forever. So what I tend to do is I make an album of a video that I'm working in, or I tend to need to go back to, and then I'll have it here to edit with, and then I'll delete the album once I've done, and all that content will go into the camera roll. But of course, your own workflow is your own, and you can just pick up tips and tricks of the things that work for you. So you can see here we've got albums within our camera roll. So let's say we go to this album here, the Seattle Mariners, a lovely team at Luma Touch took me to have an All-American experience, went to a baseball game. And you can see here we've got lots and lots of different clips here within this album. Now, when you go to something like a sporting event or you're filming something that a lot of the clips are going to look very similar. Like you can see here, I've got loads and loads of clips of the stands, of the team in the stands, of people filming from the stands. So mm -hmm. All of the clips, when you just look at the thumbnails, they're going to perhaps blur into one, okay? So what you could do is you could rename some of those clips so you can have easy access to them. So not only have you put all of the clips that you need for a particular project in an album, so they're easy access, so you're not scrolling through potentially thousands of um, individual thumbnails to find the media you're looking for, but you can rename your clips within LumaFusion itself so you can have easy access to them. So let's say here, for example, we have two clips that are of a man who's using a jib and he's recording the game. We've got one which is landscape and one which is vertical, okay? Now, I could, of course, scroll all the way through this album to go and find that, in which case I could have, you know, unlimited amount of clips within this folder. What I could do is I could tap on my individual thumbnail on my clip. I'm gonna tap on this information icon here, which is in the preview at the bottom left. And at the top there, you can say where it says image underscore 0313. It's not very helpful to me when I'm working with loads and loads of clips. So the first thing you can do is you can tap on this pencil icon on the right hand side and you can rename this however you like. So you can rename the whole thing or you can keep the extension there at the end. And perhaps you want to call it, let's say uh, jib and we're gonna call it jib one, for example, okay? And when I've pressed enter, you can see there on the left hand side on that thumbnail, now it's renamed Jib1. Let's do that with the second one. I'm going to tap on that thumbnail. I'm going to tap the pencil icon here. And I'm going to rename this as, you've guessed it, Jib2. Of course, you can rename these things whatever you like. And when I tap on that information icon, you can see on the left-hand side, Jib1, Jib2 are here. Now, if you're working with a folder with you know over 10, over 100, over 1,000 different clips, Obviously, it's going to be great. So when you search through that content, if I tap on this um, uh, search icon here on the right hand side, that magnifying glass, I can type in the word jib and I can search. And those two pieces that I've just renamed 
are going to pop up. So that's a really great way that you can filter through your content. So when you are managing your media, working with a huge amount of uh, content there that you can find that quickly and easily. Another thing that you can do within LumaFusion, I do quite like to do this, not only because it makes your timeline look beautiful and colorful when you're working with it, but really help you to manage your media in terms of exactly what clips you're working with. So for example, We've already talked about renaming our clips. Of course, you're not going to want to do that with every single clip you, you take. It might be for those clips that you're going to need on your main track. It might be for particular types of B-roll, for example. But what we can do is we can also color code our clips as well. So you can see here in my album, I've got lots of different videos of the team. So here we've got a nice video of Keith and some more team members as I'm scrolling through. So let's say anything with members of the team in, perhaps I want to color code that a particular color so that I know when I do maybe montages, I can color code a clip a particular color and I can go straight to that. So you can see here at the bottom left of the media um, library, there is a circle, a white circle there. I'm going to tap that and I'll say everything with the team in it, I'm going to create that as yellow. OK, so you can see now on the right hand side of that thumbnail, I've got a yellow, a yellow strip and I can do the same. I can tap on multiple, multiple ones. So every time I see members of our team, I'm going to tap. And I can turn those all yellow. OK, so you can see there that those clips now have been tagged as yellow within the media library. Now, if I was to bring one of those clips down onto the timeline like this. So let's say here we want to bring this clip down to the timeline. Can you see that clip is still yellow? OK, we've still got that color code going on. You can see if I bring down a different clip that hasn't been color tagged, it's just light blue. OK, it's just been given the same color as every other clip. So what you can do is you can go through an album, let's say for a particular project. Maybe you want to color code all your interviews, your pieces to camera, maybe. Um, it could be anything that has somebody speaking in it. You might want to do that yellow. You might want to have all your B-roll, let's say, for example, you might want to have all your B-roll like this and you might want to color code that green. Now, you can see you can start developing your own little workflow with color uh, with color coding in the media library where you are color coding your content. So you can now just go into that, into this album and see what's what without actually having to tap on each clip and preview it before dragging it down to the timeline. Now, an important thing to note here is when you drag this clip down, no matter how many times you drag it down, no matter what project you're in, it will stay the same color as what you've color tagged it in in the media library. So you can see as many times as I bring the same clip down, it will be green. But you can change the colors if you want to on the timeline itself. And you can do so by selecting a clip, making sure it's selected here, tapping the eye information icon and now I can give that color I can change that color say to orange let's say now you can see my clip is orange on the timeline however because it has been originally labeled as green it's going to stay green if I bring it down from that media library okay so that is a really important difference between the two because if you're going to color code content on the timeline itself that's for individual timelines, so individual projects that you're working on. But if you're going to color code content within the media library, within the album itself, that's uh, like the root color of that clip. So even if you went onto another project, for example, if I go to make a new project here and I bring this content down, you see how it's still green, no matter how many times I change that on the timeline. So when you're working to try to manage your media a little bit better, have almost like um, a color coding key in your brain. So I'm always gonna do my pieces to camera this color. I'm always gonna have my B-roll this color, or I'm always going to have interviews of this color, for example. You might even want to color code your titles, your transitions, um, even clips within story blocks, you can do so. And that means that when you search for a particular clip later on, you know, you might be in this case scenario working on a series of videos where you're filming different sporting games, for example. Now, you might not want to go through the past year's worth of content, but if every time you start working with it, you're going to start color coding your content, then you can use this search bar and you can search for key colors. So for example, green, and you can see all of the different um, clips that I've color coded as green are going to pop up as well 
as clips that have green in the title. OK, so it just makes your everyday working life a little bit easier when you start thinking of putting things in albums, renaming your clips, uh, color coding them as and how you like to work. OK, now you can also work with content, as we've discussed, uh, which has been imported. This is going to work in exactly the same way. So if I just close that uh, search bar there and I go back into our media library, we can see we can access anything that we've imported directly into our device. If I tap in that in, in a folder itself, so let's say here, this, this, this content works in exactly the same way. So it doesn't matter whether you've taken the content on your device or whether you've imported it, whether you've airdropped it across, it doesn't matter whether it's a linked folder to an album or an additional app, you can still work with this material. Now, obviously, if you're working with a lot of material that's um, many, many gigabytes, large files, you might start to think about some of the storage that's going to be taken up on your device. And that's where Scott's going to come in now and talk about external hard drives. But what I would say is if you are working with imported media, make sure we have just released an episode on this. Um, Amy did a piece uh, about deleting imported media, which you can do so easily within the imported album here. So if you were, for example, to start downloading lots and lots of content, which you can see I've got in my settings menu over here, I've got over 380 different pieces of, of um, content that I've downloaded, uh, 380 gigabytes worth of content, I should say. Anything you, you've downloaded that you want to remove, you can just tap on it directly. If it's not used within a project, you can delete it. So that might be a great way to start managing all of that content that you've brought in that's taking up too much space. Just tapping on a piece of media and deleting it from your imported folder as long as it's not being used on a timeline. Okay, keep your question. Yeah, I just want to. I just want to add to that in terms yeah. of like it's important. It's like just so you know, we the Luma Fusion won't let you delete anything that's in a project. So if you've imported it and it's not being used in a project, that's when you can delete it. If it is in a project, the trash can is going to be gray and it's got not going to allow you to delete it. So that's your like safe space with the imported media. Great. So I'm trying to find an example of that, but perhaps I let's see if I jump into holiday contest that's probably so uh, as amy was saying there you see these have all got a little tick on them guys that means that this this content that i've imported in has been on a timeline already so if i press that now you see how it's not letting me delete that and that's protecting the content then because it's been it has to use this media within the within the project itself so that's gonna help you feel a little bit better guys that you're not going to accidentally delete anything that you need Okay, Scott, are you ready to talk about external editing on hard drives? I sure am, <laughs> except I'm not sure my throat's going to work that well. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned at the top, LumaFusion has the ability to uh, enable an editor to work directly from a fast external SSD. There are a number of kind of parameters around that to make sure that you're able to do it and do it reliably. Um, first, you need to have a compatible device your edit device has to be among those that can do it so um any any newer ipad that has the uh, the usb c port on the bottom is going to allow you to do your uh, external drive editing and the ipad iphone 15 pro models the iphone 15 uh, models that are not marked pro they have the same port but they don't have the speed so it won't quite uh, at least it isn't spec to to do the external drive editing directly um, and Android devices, there's a lot of variability in the capacities, but the but the app has the ability to turn on external drive editing in the uh, in the preferences and on any edit device. But you'll need to go into uh, uh, help and settings and the preferences pane and and toggle on external drive editing. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward process. The next part. That you need to do to have it work is it's got to be a, a compatible fast uh, SSD. And so there are a few models that we like for that of the Samsung T7. Uh, uh, we use a lot of those. Um, La C makes a drive that Apple actually sells directly on their website. Um, they sell that as being, um, being geared specifically for the iPhone 15 to, to edit or shoot to and edit from. Um, and 
I have a I have a website. We have a website with specs on how what the drive needs to have in the way of uh, uh, its read and write speeds. So it needs to be, I think, a uh, thousand fifty megabits per second uh, read and write speeds, and it should be formatted in APFS format. That's uh, that's the format that iOS likes. So I'm talking now for for the Apple devices. Your drive ideally should, when you buy it, it should be made for Mac. Or if you have it, if you can, um, it's best to format the drive using uh, the Apple's procedure uh, and and the Disk Utility um, app to uh, erase the drive and format it into the format that iOS likes the best, which is APFS. Um, that is not true for when you're using it on Android. Probably uh, just the, as it comes out of the box, you'll be able to use it. Uh, and the, the the final thing is your cable. The cable that you use needs to be, uh, you know, we, we all have a lot of these cables around and some of them are just a charge cable, even though it will plug in and it'll transmit data, it won't send the data quickly enough. And so it needs to be the, the official data cable, preferably the one that came with the drive. Um, that's sometimes we find people have a problem with external drive editing. Everything works except that it still falls down a little bit, and that's because they they're using a charge cable to connect their drive. The uh, the SSD. And another thing that happened. Oh, I think you're going to get to this, Scott. But the um, USB hubs are really key. Um, and yes, I know you're getting into that. I do yeah. want to say that one of the main problems we have is people, the customers are like, oh, but my drive has always worked. And I say, what kind of drive is it? And then it's got a slow, it, do, it isn't um, uh, 1,050 mega per, megabits per second, like, but it's worked before in the past. And what happens is, is when you get into those longer projects, that's when the speed then you'll see like media not loading in and things like that. If your if your drive is not 1050 megabytes per second, as you get into bigger projects, that's when things begin to get a little um, difficult. Yep. Uh, and so Amy, as Amy started to say, there are a number of devices. It, I mean, so if I'm editing with an iPad, I really like to have it plugged into power. And sometimes I like to have it, or this is also true with an iPhone 15. Uh, Pro. If I'm editing with a device and I'm sitting in one place, I want to have it plugged into power. I want to have it plugged into a monitor so I can use the uh, use the features of 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 LumaFusion to let me um, run an external monitor as well. And so I'm going to want to plug in some sort of a hub that will let me plug in that drive and that power and that HDMI. And there are an awful lot of devices out there um, that do have those that connectivity. However, there are only a few devices or a limited class of devices that will do that in, in compatibility with iOS and the speeds necessary for external drive editing. And so a couple that we've found, found this little this little guy from a kind of a local Seattle company called Pluggable, um, and it, it's called a 7-in-1, Pluggable 7-in-1. I'll put a link for that. I'm not trying to sell it for them, but I really like the device. It's You, you can literally set your iPhone 15 on this thing and use it as though it is a computer. I can plug a mouse in, I can plug uh, headphones or a microphone in, I can plug uh, two or two, you know, one or more drives, uh, SSDs into it, and I can hook up a monitor. And uh, it's, it's remarkable the kind of horsepower it lets you harness right at your desk with that little edit device. This is a much bigger hub that does the same thing. Uh, it's o OWC Thunderbolt Go Dock. And this is like a, you know, sort of rolling heavy, uh, but it's going to let you, you can hook up multiple monitors to it and you could hook up multiple drives to it if you have occasion to do that. The t you know, the times you want to use external drive editing um, are when you have media that is more than you want to put on your device. Our edit devices, an iPhone or an iPad or, a, or an Android phone or tablet, you know, they have very typically limited storage uh, capacity. And if you want to be able to keep that free so you can keep capturing stuff, or if you just don't want to move a ton of data onto your device, connect, get you uh, an, SS, an SSD and connect it to your device and um, hook it up and go. Scott, what about those times where, for example, somebody's working on a project, they're halfway through, and they're mm -hmm. finding, okay, I didn't really think about 
my storage from the beginning okay now like everything's everywhere what are the dangers with working with like missing media because I know that there's obviously sometimes where you can get into a bit of a sticky situation and Amy I'm sure you might have had some emails about this where you know somebody's halfway through and then they want to now transfer their content from their device onto the external drive can you talk to us a little bit about any sticky situations that can come up from that or like what what would what you would advise in that scenario? Sure. Yeah. In fact, I had um, uh, a few months ago, I had a situation where I was editing a device directly from uh, an SSD, a fast drive, and that drive began to fail. I was able, sometimes I could access it. I could look at it in my, in my computer or connect it, but it wouldn't work reliably. And so I knew that I needed to transfer that stuff off onto another, onto another device. And, uh, LumaFusion keeps track of media, not by its file name particularly, but by its location. And so if, especially in the case of external drive editing, when you connect, when you connect media from an external drive to a project in LumaFusion, uh, LumaFusion makes a map of where to find that. And that's how it accesses that file. Um, it doesn't necessarily, of course, it looks at the file name, but it's really down to the location. So what I needed to do was take my old drive and uh, copy it directly to to a new drive. Uh, and what I mean is, when I mean copy it directly, I had a brand new drive and I formatted it APFS and I copied everything on it in exactly the file structure that exists on the failing drive and gave it the gave the drive the very same name, gave the folder the folder inside that my project data was uh, media was in the same name. So it, it for all intents and purposes, the iPad that I was using doesn't know that I connected a new drive. And in that case, it was able to reconnect that media and uh, and uh, I saved myself the heartbreak of a lost project because the drive broke. Um, and another it, great thing about that system yeah. and being able is that you can easily share projects. So like if you're working with another editor, um, that you can, if you have identical drives, they do have to be identical, named the same, with the same file structure, all the same folders, all the same media, right? But then you can simply airdrop or um, you know Dropbox over the um, a backup project of the of what you're working on, and that editor, then you can the the editor, your second editor, can plug in their drive and just pick off where you left off with your, with the latest edit. It's, it's really, and we have a video, we have a tutorial on that. I'll put it in the chat right now. So, so SSDs do like really, um, um, you do have to keep track. You can't, you know, you don't want to be moving media around, but it does give you a lot of freedom. And Amy, so I can that, sorry, Scott. Ahead, I was gonna say when you're working with LumaFusion project packages and Obviously, we, we want our editors to be able to back up those packages so that they can then go re-download an entire timeline with all of that media then. So if we have someone watching right now who has an amazing project that they've done, they have all of their media, how can they best use an external drive in order to make sure they can then put that away in a cardboard box somewhere and then bring it back out in a year's time and then restart their project? That's right. That's right. So I would, so once you get your, your project is at least for this rendition of it is done, but you never know if you're going to want to go back to it or, you know, maybe a film festival is going to want subtitles or something that you, you need to keep your project. Right. Um, so you, you, after you put it out into the world or whatever you're going to do with your project, then you export your project as um, a LumaFusion project package full media. That means it goes with all the, everything is all together in one beautiful package. So that means that you, maybe you're not going to keep your original media because it's like too much. Maybe it's like terror drives, right? And you're like, or terabytes, you're like, that's too much, but I want to keep that project from that shoot. And so then you export LumaFusion project file, onto an SSD, label that SSD so that you know that it's on there. And then at any point you can come and say, like, I want to go revisit that. I'm going to re-edit that. I'm going to give it a different ending, plug that SSD again, 
tap on the LumaFusion project package, boom, and it opens in LumaFusion ready to roll with your media attached. Brilliant. I, I actually spoke to somebody um, a few months ago who they lost their they lost their iPad, but because they had backed up a LumaFusion project package, it was like, you know, that sinking feeling where you think, you know, you, you're obviously losing a tablet in itself, you know, that's a heartbreak, but actually losing your content is, is something else entirely. So being able to back up your projects on these external hard drives is, is well, it's just something that we we should all be doing, especially with those ones, as you say, Amy, that might be brought back in the future <laughs> where you do need to make tweaks and you never thought you were going to need to. You thought that was all done and you've got to bring it back. Scott, were you okay. saying say something there? Yeah, there were there were two things I was going to say. One is sometimes uh, uh, in in any video project, you might get to the point where you realize, okay, I've actually I'm I'm far enough into this. It's time for me to start organizing some things, and I want to uh, raise a caution here because the tendency can be like I want to go into those albums, I want to go into my imported folders and start putting things into bins um, and make sure that I can find my way back to it. Uh, however, because of what I mentioned earlier, that LumaFusion uses the relies on the location of a file to to access it when it's uh, giving you playback and letting you edit. Uh, if you have already have stuff on your timeline, and then move that stuff around in the back end, it can go missing. LumaFusion can have a hard time finding it, and a lot of times you can find it back. It'll say, "Well, media miss, missing media or unlinked media," and then you can find it again. But it's really best to do that ahead of time. To, if you're if you're going to, in the way that Caroline mentioned, you can do that in albums in your Photos app or in folders in your imported media app. And uh, uh, that's for a different video to really lay out a workflow about that. But we can, uh, we're happy to happy to talk to you about that via our support th support channel. Uh, the other thing I was going to say is, you can use multiple drives on a single project if you wish say a bunch more media comes in later to a project you're working on and one drive is already filled you can you know it, there are hard, hardware requirements to do it but you you can edit using more than one drive if you need to um and keep a project intact so there's no missing media that's and how about yeah. working with with for example, you know, we've got a lot of users now who are really getting to grips with Multicam Studio and they've got content from lots of different cameras, you know, up to six different cameras. Would you advise putting that all onto the one external hard drive or, you know, working obviously on those big shoots, you could mm -hmm. have content coming from everywhere. And then you think, right, OK, before I actually start putting this into the synchronizer, where is this going to be, you know, mapped from? Yeah, I think. Uh, as, assuming you have an SSD with sufficient space to hold all of the media, it's always going to be a little bit more streamlined if it could be on if it could be on one SSD. It keeps it minimizes the number of cable connections that could be could cause you an issue. Um, it's going to be a little bit little just cleaner. But if you do need to bring in more media, say your multicam shoot, uh, you know another somebody turns up with another memory card and it brings you too much you know, it would push you over the top of your uh, uh, two terabytes on your little SSD, plug in another drive. Um, of course, there are other, you know, uh, other strategies you could take, but I I just, I recently discovered the ability to, <laughs> to connect more than one drive um, be, with these hardware solutions. And I, it's saved my bacon a couple of times. So it's nice mm. like that. It's almost like finding a workflow that works for you within the individual projects that, you know, as, as you said at the beginning, we've got so many different editors working on such different projects from different cameras and with different, you know, different equipment that they're working with, you know, sh also just sharing, you know, your own workflows and, you know, people watching this now, like when, when we post to YouTube and within, and within our own community, please do feel free to just post how you edit and how you manage your workflow in terms of all of the media that you've got um, stored on your device or externally, because we do have, as I say, you know, we have filmmakers and we have, you know, complete editing novices. So it's a, it's a complete range of people that are just passionate about editing, but it's just a case of getting the right workflow for, for them. 
whether that's one or two hard drives. I think maybe we'll start with one, Scott, and then we can go to two. But yeah. I think that's great, if, you know, being able to do that. Um, what we're going to do, guys, is uh, I'm going to send out a recording of this to all of you with the YouTube link for those of you that have joined today with some of these additional links that Amy and Scott have put in the chat. So we will give you those additional resources. Um, if any of you guys watching at home want to contact us directly, you can do so via the Luma Touch support um, uh, website or, of course, just ping any of us. We've all got our own emails or you can just uh, leave us a comment on any of our YouTube channels. Uh, we've got the Your Problem Solved and the Did You Know YouTube playlist that are perfect for asking your questions where we've got Amy, Scott and Max um, giving us weekly episodes of tips and tricks on how to work with our media and to do other things within, within Luma Fusion itself. So we have not got a date for our next live session. So if you would like to suggest the next topic that we discuss as a team with you guys, please feel free to get in touch for that. Uh, but other than that, guys, is there anything else you would like to, to round off today's session with? Yeah, let us know in the chat, like if this is useful for you and like you've stayed on. So that's awesome. So hopefully you're getting something out of it. But it is, we'd love to know, like, yeah, I didn't know this. This helped a lot. Exactly, guys. Don't be a stranger. Get in touch. Keep in touch with us as you're working through your projects. We do have a lot of editors where we talk to them at the beginning of their story idea. And then they send us the final package and, you know, Amy and Max and Scott have been working with them along the way. And then they've been joining us for training. So uh, please don't be a stranger. Get in touch with us and we will see you next time for the next uh, Little Touch Academy live webinar. So we'll see you soon. Thank you for joining. Thanks for joining y'all. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Happy editing. Bye.